This is the First Gen Pilot Podcast, episode 22, coming right up. What's going on, aviators? My name is Abraham, and I am your host. Today's episode, we have Evan Loft, a commercial pilot up in Canada doing a lot of great adventures. Now, his name might sound familiar because he does a lot of great things on social media, especially on YouTube, where he shares a lot of his flying and all the great things that he does with a lot of educational videos that are so helpful to others. Make sure to check him out at Evan Loft on YouTube. I'll have the link down below in the show notes. Today's episode, we talk about how he got into aviation and developed his love of flying. With that, we talk about his current job where he does a lot of cool flying and how he got into that. With that, we also talk about a lot of great tips to help people who are in aviation currently or people who are pursuing the dream. This is an episode that you do not want to miss. There's a lot of great information in this one. So strap in in the next hour. You'll learn a lot of great things from this podcast. And aviators, I've put an Amazon link together with all the things a pilot needs. We're talking about flight simulators, knee pads, headsets, and Anything you could think of, it's on this link. Make sure you check it down below on the show notes. Also, it's going to be on my Instagram at firstgenpilot. That's one S T dot G N dot pilot. Check out this Amazon link. Also, don't forget to check out the YouTube channel. I've got a couple videos on there already, and I'll also be posting the podcast video version on the YouTube channel. So make sure you check that out at First Gen Pilot. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to leave a review down below and let me know what you think. Also, don't forget to follow the podcast on any of the platforms that you listen to on without further ado here's evan loft yeah okay everybody uh i'm evan loft um uh kind of uh well i've been a pilot for about just about 18 years now since i got my license and uh uh yeah excited to do this podcast so <laughs> i'm prepared for the questions <laughs> yeah hi evan welcome on the first gym pilot podcast i really appreciate you being here today man Thanks, man. I, I I appreciate you inviting me on. This is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So we're gonna be discussing your uh, history in aviation and how you got into it. And um, the first question I like to ask is, how did you get into aviation? Uh, okay, so my my I started really young. I started uh, my first flying lesson was when I was about uh, well, just turning fourteen years old, and I got inspired by my my dad. He wasn't. Uh, he wasn't a licensed pilot, but he started his flight training, and then he got too busy with his work to actually finish it. But okay. he had a lot of his old flying books that I, I stumbled upon, and he actually, uh, back when I was learning to, or when I got my interest into flying, um, he had purchased me Microsoft Flight Simulator 2000, and uh, <laughs> I, I didn't have all the, you know, all the controls and stuff, so I had to use the keyboard, but. That kind of sparked a little more interest in aviation because I got to fly, um, you know, a jumbo jet between the buildings in Chicago, which I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah, and, uh, and you know, and fly under bridges, and uh, that was that was kind of you know what first sparked my interest in aviation. And then I really became fascinated with the mechanics of flying, so jet engines and all that kind of stuff, and it led me down the rabbit hole of getting my license. And I thought I would just get my private license. And once I finished that, um, I started my training when I was 14. And my first flight instructor said I was too young to learn how to fly because uh, uh, nothing was sinking in. I just wanted to fly the airplane. I didn't care about all the other, all the other stuff that went with it in ground school. Um, so I took a little, little time off. And then uh, this lady pilot that I got linked up with, she said, hey, I'll train you up to become a pilot. And I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, she was uh, quite an inspiration to me so she's the one that actually finished my licenses and uh, um, got me to the commercial level and then I did my multi and IFR and uh, since then I just ended up uh, finding jobs never actually made a resume or anything it just once once you start networking out there in the aviation world then you can find yourself some pretty cool opportunities so that's 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 what first inspired me was my father obviously and then um strangely enough microsoft flights <laughs> yeah yeah definitely that's all it takes man just being around airplanes or like doing that game that you loved playing as a kid there and um you know like you said like your flight instructor was saying that you couldn't uh do the studying behind it i can know i can see a 14 year old just wanting to fly 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 because i mean that's the way all the fun is nobody wants to study <laughs> yeah yeah 
for me, sitting in the classroom wasn't really my thing, but uh, uh, as soon as I was out in the hangar looking at the airplanes and kind of taking them apart, that's what really fascinated me and what really made me want to continue flying. And even to this day, I'm still fascinated by that kind of stuff. So, um, so I, I owe a lot of it to obviously my, you know, my my dad and um, and whatnot. But a big part of it was just being around airplanes, and it kind of snowballed from there. Yeah, definitely. All right, and then like funding your training, how did you go by that? Uh, so I did my training. Uh, that was obviously a while ago. So flight training was a lot less expensive back then than it is now there's a lot of demand for pilots which creates a lot of demand for uh flight instructors which means that now that there's you know students are recognizing there's a demand for pilots there's uh um, obviously a huge demand for for flight training so that's driven the price up plus the price of fuel all that kind of stuff um but when i did my training um I was pretty young, so I was in school, and my parents kind of looked at it like, okay, well, it's an extracurricular activity because it was actually relatively inexpensive to learn how to fly. Um, when I started my training, I think you could rent a 172. Um, I can't quite remember, but I think you could rent one for uh, about $80 an hour. <laughs> That's so pretty good. Think about it. It's actually not that expensive back then. And um, then to build some experience and stuff, you – uh, you get to know people at the airport with airplanes and there was one point where a guy was lending me a twin engine airplane basically for free he said yeah take it whenever you want just you know don't crash it and uh use it however you feel but uh you know keep the hours on it to you know so it you know everything stays lubricated on it and um, yeah that's how i built some time and experience and then you know renting in between there and whatnot and then uh working up towards getting my first job which which really involved more networking and stuff but the funding part of it is a challenge for a lot of people today because of the cost obviously and a lot of students get into a lot of debt to try to fund their flight training and once they're finished uh, you still have to have a lot you know a fair bit of experience in order to get a decent job so that's where you really have to be good at networking with people and finding a way to get your foot in the door without having to uh, spend a lot of time and money trying to get experience because there are some not loopholes but there are some sort of uh, hacks that you can do as a pilot um, with less experience to get your first aviation job that uh, uh, that can be a little more forgiving with not having much experience so um, <clears throat> there's some tips I actually made a video on my channel about how to get your first aviation job um, and uh, there's a couple you know, I, I've known some people that have done very, very well and basically made miracles happen for themselves um, at very, very uh, low time uh, flying airplanes that I, even I could just barely dream of flying. <laughs> so, uh, so there's there's definitely ways to go about it, but uh, um, uh, but yeah, funding is a big is a big challenge for most people now, uh, just because it's so expensive because of the demand for flight training. So. Yeah, definitely. And then like, if there's somebody out there who's trying to get into aviation, like maybe in Canada right now, and a kid, what is the best way you'd say to go attack this uh, thing that they're uh, after? Uh, I always tell uh, new or new pilots, I shouldn't say new pilots, but people interested in flying, uh, you can Google everything all you want. Uh, but it really comes down to you just have to go to the flight schools and talk to the people that work there. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the US, it's probably a little easier because there's a lot of flight schools everywhere well actually that might make it slightly more challenging because you kind of have to do a little bit more shopping around yep. uh, but up in canada you you i just recommend you just google what flying schools are in your area and then go check them out because uh, they're very easy to you know to talk to and um, the best information you're going to get is right from the people working there yep um it's a lot simpler than you know, trying to go to university and all that kind of stuff. It's like how I did my flight job. I just showed up at the airport one day. I was like, I want to learn to fly. And they said, oh, good. That's that's the <laughs> that's the only requirement. <laughs> so if you want to learn to fly, well, that's that's all that we, you know, screen for. And um, and if you got, you know, if, you, if you're allowed to, you know, I mean, if you're able to, uh, you know, pay for the airplane and rent it and uh, an instructor, then, and you know the the upfront costs like for ground school and stuff, then 
you can basically get in. The problem now is that there's so many people wanting to become pilots that there is uh, a limited supply of flight instructors and flight schools. So now there is, it's not uncommon to see places that have, or flight schools that have waiting lists and, or they will screen students, you know, uh, to make sure that they're not wasting their time on someone that's, that's not going to go anywhere mm -hmm. uh, when really they have other people in the queue that, that they would rather train. So, so it is more competitive to get into fly into flight school, but the best way to do it, just go to your local airport, talk to the person that I just walk into a flight school and say, Hey, I want to learn to fly. Who's in charge. And they probably point you to the, you know, the CFI or something or the chief flight instructor there or one of the instructors and then just pick their brains on what you need to do, mm -hmm. what, how much time it's going to take, what the cost is. And, uh, you know, if you show initiative that you want to really pursue it, um, then I think it's a lot easier to get in the door than, than people probably think. If you're just phoning a flight school to say, well, hey, this is what I want to do. And they'll say, well, there's a wait list here or you got to do this. Mm -hmm. if you just show up. Uh, chances are they'll get you in, I think. That's, that's, that's my experience. Um, and from people I know that uh, that seems to be the best thing. And I think just a, a matter of, you know, basic principles, if you show up, that's half the battle. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's, that's all it takes, just coming up, coming up there and just showing up definitely is the first step to uh, start your flight training. I mean, uh, uh, just yeah. for me as well, I mean, I had like funny enough, me getting to aviation, I had to do something with Instagram because I was out here texting people on there and next thing they literally told me come to the airport I'll, I'll you can meet this instructor that has this airplane and next thing you know i was <laughs> on my way to flying you know which is great yeah and that's a that's a new thing because i never had instagram when i started flying well instagram i don't think instagram didn't exist uh when i started my flight training so it was mm -hmm. pretty much just show up to the airport yeah um, whereas now there's so many resources online uh, be it, you have to be kind of careful with where you get the resources from and stuff because some can be sort of misleading. Yep. But uh, you have you have a lot of resources available online that you could probably, I mean, <clears throat> not legally, but practically, you could probably learn to fly an airplane by just watching videos online. <laughs> now. You know, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be, gr it wouldn't be pretty, but, <laughs> but there's so much out there now that you don't have to invest a lot of money into getting the resources that you need to actually learn the material and become a good competent pilot mm -hmm. um, there's so much out there now that you can just browse uh, browse the resources online and get get so much further ahead than what the you know a flight school will teach you you know in itself right so yep. um, <clears throat> yeah so no I, that's that's what I think is probably one of the uh, best things to do just go right into the flight schools. If you get an iffy feeling about one, just go to the next one. Cause there's lots of options out there. Um, and, uh, and all, uh, one of my biggest recommendations is fly with someone that has experience. Um, there's a lot of, of flight instructors that don't have much experience because, um, there's such demand for, for flight instructors right now that, that, uh, pretty much your flight instructor could be someone that just got their, commercial license and their instructor rating and they have no real world practical experience so yeah you can find an instructor that has worked in charter or flow you know flown bigger airplanes or has mm -hmm. a lot of ifr experience that will uh that will be a a lot of training so yeah definitely i i agree with that definitely all right and then like the type of flying that you're doing right now what is that like uh, so the flying that I do is all uh, private flying. So I've described it to some as freelance flying, uh, contract pilot sort of stuff. So <clears throat> it's different from like the charter world because uh, I deal with owners of their own aircraft. So someone buys an airplane and then uh, they come to me for uh, pilot services or some. a lot of it's kind of aircraft management now. Um, and being kind of a, a one person operation with, um, you know, it was kind of hard to do it myself. So, uh, I've actually got a couple other people, one being my brother, who's a very good pilot. And, uh, we've got a small group of 
of pilots here that kind of work together to help uh, the owners run their airplanes. Um, it's all private flying that I do right now. So okay. the owners, we run uh, through a like a scheduling system, and they book the airplane, and everybody works together uh, to make sure maintenance is done. And uh, they're using the airplanes for their own, uh, you know, for their own business uh, or for their own pleasure, right? So, um, <clears throat> but they trust us as their pilots. So um, we're kind of the go-to people. We're trained on the aircraft, and um, and it, it it works quite well because uh, because of just sort of how casual. Uh, we can book things in. We can we talk to the owners. You know, you text everybody texts one another, um, so it works really well. It's 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 sometimes organized chaos because people are booking airplanes at the same time, but everybody works together and the owners get along and they're absolutely great people. So uh, and the pilots as well. So it it works out phenomenally. And we do have a couple pilots that work um, <clears throat> you know more regularly as you know, for, for other carriers and they do this kind of on the side. So it's, it's a, it's a great way for us to get a lot of adventure out of the flying that we do because we're not flying all the time. So sometimes the owners want to fly to a location and they might, might want to be there for a week, in which case then you're there for a couple of days and maybe you fly home and you come back and pick the airplane up and it's very flexible that way, but it offers a lot more kind of adventure. Um, the flying part is only, you know, only, probably 20% of what we do. The rest is, you know, getting to know the owners and, you know, spending time in some cool places and, um, yeah, and networking. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's different. Uh, the kind of flying I do is, is like I said, it's pretty much freelance flying, but we already have, like, we kind of know who we're flying for already. Uh, we've built those relationships and stuff and, um, and it's, it's been a great, a great learning experience and it's a good thing for people that want to do, you know, for experienced pilots that want to uh, do some part-time flying on the side. Um, not the best for someone that wants to build a lot of time or mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of hours. Yep. Um, but it is great for getting really good experience in a, like a high performance airplane, uh, flying IFR all the time. And, uh, <clears throat> and that sort of stuff. But as far as like building hours, it's not about that. It's about providing a good quality, like, you know, pilot service and uh, just giving like uh, the owners what they, what they need. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've seen your flying it's super cool places that you go to on your YouTube and stuff, but uh, I think that's, that's where the fun is, man. <laughs> yeah. That's what I, I always, I always like tell people, I'm like, if you like fishing and you like, you know, going to, uh, <clears throat> and you like hanging out with the owners and uh, <clears throat> and networking and flying to new airports and um, <clears throat> sometimes you're flying a lot. Sometimes you're not flying much at all. Yeah, and this is a job for you. Or if you got something else that you do on the side and uh, flying is more of a passion, um, then this is perfect. Definitely, definitely. All right, and then like so, did you do your CFI stuff as well? As well, or um, did you just go into the corporate world? No, my uh, I I tried to do uh, I I I went straight into this kind of uh, kind of corporate flying uh, rather than doing the flight instructor route. I tried the flight instructor route, but mm -hmm. uh, I got through a couple lessons, and then I had uh, a situation where <clears throat> back in the day um, when I was learning to fly, you were you know. If you rented the plane, you were responsible for fueling it up and moving it around the ramp and all this kind of stuff. Yep. And my uh, my instructor, who was teaching me the the flight instructor course, um, they were going through a little bit of changes. So they hired a person to do the fueling. They hired a person to you know like a ramp person to do yeah. to take care of all that. And now all of a sudden, students weren't allowed to you know move the airplane around. You basically had to tell someone to do this and that. And I was always used to just fueling the plane up myself. Like you pull the plane over, do it all yourself. But they, they went away from that. And <clears throat> there was one instance where <laughs> uh, I think my, my flight instructor, this is a you know totally different flight instructor. Uh, uh, he was the guy teaching me my instructor rating. He, I think he had a, you know, his, he had a full plate that day and he was kind of stressed out and, and they had this new system going on of like who fuels the plane and you put the plane here if you, if it needs fuel and someone comes and fuels it, you know, like, <laughs> Yeah. It was very confusing. And um, 
we we were a few lessons in already, and um, and we get in the airplane, and it, it, <laughs> we we started taxiing the airplane, and I was, and even when I was taxiing, I thought this airplane feels a little light. Like, do we have any fuel? And he looked at me, and um, and I said, and he asked me if the airplane was fueled, and I said, well, I checked the fuel because we uh, you know we needed fuel. Yeah. And I said, and then I followed the procedure and we parked it in the spot where we're supposed to get fuel. And then in between there, you know, we did, <clears throat> we did like a briefing and all this. So it's kind of all over the place. And then we get in the plane and found out there, there wasn't, uh, there was hardly any fuel in it because someone didn't fuel it. Yeah. Which ultimately was my responsibility because we didn't get the plane <laughs> to fuel it. Yeah. So, but, you know, there are a lot of things going on. And I think my instructor that day, he just said, he threw his hands up in the air and he said, to heck with this flight instructing stuff i'm out and he has to quit <laughs> like he actually quit his flying job like he quit the flight school wow uh so then after that i was like oh and i felt i felt pretty bad but um i was like maybe this flight instructor thing's not for me um and it just wasn't the right timing and then that was when all this other stuff kind of lined up to be flying these airplanes so then i was like Ooh, i kind of skipped the whole flight instructor route and i'm glad it went that way yeah, you got first-hand experience with what, uh, how frustrating flight instructor can be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I always have uh, I have a, the utmost respect for flight instructors because I don't know how how they can you know how mentally they can go through each day you know sending students solo yeah praying that they don't crash. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I mean my first solo was was not pretty and. Um, <laughs> And my flight instructor seemed to be pretty chill with that. You know, watching me do my first solo from like the side of the runway with a walkie-talkie, I was like, "That takes some big cojones." <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and uh, and uh, obviously the, the girl that taught me how to fly, she had lots of students at the same time as she was, um, you know, doing charter flights as well. So there's, you know, flight instructors do have a lot on their plate when they're busy. So, yep, uh, it helps them to have students that kind of understand that <laughs> yeah definitely like right now i'm doing my i'm working on my flight instructing finish up my commercial as well oh you are okay oh, yeah that's awesome. it's it's definitely a new language man like trying to teach someone how to do things definitely <laughs> making my flight yeah, plans right I, now and it's like really tough <laughs> yeah no kidding if, yeah <laughs> yeah it's, it's, there's so many things that can happen yeah while you're in the airplane with a student and when your students on you know on their own yeah so that, that's that's a that's something I'm. I'm really glad I kind of skipped that. Okay. Um, but uh, because now in hindsight, I'm thinking, no, that would have been. It would have been a pretty, probably a pretty stressful part of, of life. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah. All right, and then so have you had any scary experiences? Uh, I know you've had a ton of flights and a lot of experience under your belt. So have you had any scary experiences? Uh, yeah, I've had quite a few. I think every pilot does okay. because what you learn in flight school isn't everything that you need to know. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of blanket covers everything. Yeah. And then you, as you start flying, <clears throat> you know, in real life, uh, you learn a lot of things from just experience. And, uh, there have been lots of things that I know now that I wish they taught me in flight school because, uh, it would have been very useful to know before it, you know, scared me. And um, this sounds naive, but I think a lot of pilots that that end up, you know, going far in their careers, they will probably all admit that there's a <clears throat> there's an element of luck to everything, where you know you do some sort of mistake, and it just so happens that you know it you know it didn't uh, result in an accident or something like that because. Mm -hmm. uh, because you know, we're the, you, you don't learn everything you need to know in flight school. So when you get in the real world, all of a sudden, uh, like I, I can think of a few off the top of my head. <clears throat> you know, like my first time uh, de-icing an airplane, and it was at nighttime, and I was looking at you know the wings of the plane, and there's frost on them, and I seen another airplane, a Pilatus takeoff, and it had ice all over the place, and I and I was trying to remember like, well, what is the rules around? you know, flying with frost on the wings, I, and, you know, mm -hmm. and it's zero. That's what it is up up here in Canada. You have to remove all the contamination. And so I was out there scrubbing with, you know, with a broom, and then it would kind of frost up. And then next thing you know, you're, you're you know, you're stopped again, and you're out there trying to 
<clears throat> trying to <clears throat> sorry spray the wings off and then it starts snowing and then you're wondering well what is this fluid that i'm using is it good enough <laughs> um, and you know you're by yourself and you have an owner on the airplane and you're thinking well i should you know uh, maybe i should maybe I, maybe i won't go flying today but then uh but then you know you do a de-icing and that was my first time having someone actually de-ice the air. Well, I shouldn't say the first time someone de-iced the airplane, but the first time where I've used two different types of de-icing fluid mm-hmm. on, on an airplane, and I was pretty young. And the guy asked me, he said, well, uh, do you want me to spray the windshield? And I thought, ah, oh, sure, whatever. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, why wouldn't you? You're spraying the whole airplane anyway. <laughs> said, okay, kind of looked at me kind of strange. Said, oh, well, sure, up to you. And then he sprayed the windshield. No, I didn't know is I uh is that the uh, the uh, the de-icing fluid that was on there? It requires about a hundred knots. Um, I believe the the breakup point is a hundred knots where it'll start to like come off the wings. Um, so uh, when we started taking off down the runway, it was at nighttime, and the uh, windshield just like all glued up. And we have no windshield wipers on the plane I was flying at the time. Okay. And, so all of a sudden, I couldn't see anything, and the uh, and you couldn't even see the runway lights because it was nighttime, right? Mm-hmm. And so it was the first time I've ever taken off an airplane and not seen how I was going, you know, <clears throat> what direction I was going down the runway. And I was afraid to stop because I thought, well, if I stop, I'm going to have to use braking, and that could cause me to go off the runway. So uh, very very nerve wracking for me. And I was just looking at the airspeed, like, come on, get to a hundred knots. <laughs> and thankfully yeah. we did, didn't go off the runway anywhere. And that was a big learning thing for me where I said, okay, uh, de-icing fluid, don't put it on the windshield. <laughs> um, and, but I wish someone would, everybody, people taught me about de-icing and all that stuff, but that was a very critical piece of information. I wish I knew then. Yeah. And now I know very well. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, just other things that you learn while flying, you know, through weather, different types of clouds, there's been, you know, thunderstorms uh, can be very, very scary, especially um, especially at night. Uh, but when, you know, you learn how to use the radar and uh, I've had some scary moments flying in the Rocky Mountains where, um, you know, you fly into some pretty nasty icing conditions that aren't forecast and, uh, and you kind of learn from that, like what, what to expect in different types of clouds and where they sit in the, you know, in the valleys and stuff like that. So, um, uh, so yeah, there, there's, there's been lots of little, not, not, not lots of near death experiences, that's for sure. But lots of times where I've been definitely nervous mm-hmm. and slightly, you know, things that have slightly scared me. I think every pilot will relate to that. Yep. Um, but, uh, thankfully, you know, uh, Thankfully, everything kind of pans out okay that you can walk, you know, you can walk away saying, oh, I won't do that again. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, that's um, that's how you become a great pilot, you know, learning all from all your mistakes. That's the, like the best way you can do it. I mean, getting into the situations and knowing how to handle them and be, being able to actually handle them when you're yeah, in the situation. There's, there's a good saying that says, uh, um, oh, I'm trying to remember how it goes now. Um, uh Good judgment comes from experience, but experience comes from bad judgment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there's uh, there's a lot to be said for that. <laughs> yeah, especially in the aviation world. I mean, we learn when things go bad, right? That's when we start changing things. I mean, we can look at aviation history and, like, all the bad things led to us being better pilots. So <laughs> you never want to yeah, be totally. <laughs> someone else's and, PowerPoint. And, That's what my flight instructor yeah. said. <laughs> Yeah, and like you'll definitely learn, you know, experience that with students being a flight instructor. You'll be able to see all the little mistakes that people do, but mm-hmm. then, uh, um, you know, try to pass on as much knowledge as you can. Like I, my, my, I was lucky. That that's why it's important to have a flight instructor that has some real world experience. Yep. Because when I came out of flying, um, or my IFR rating, I flew. I remember doing a uh, uh, for my one of my IFR flights with an instructor uh we actually you know like you'd fly imc and i remember it was kind of a really gloomy kind of cold day and uh we went and did a bunch of practice approaches in this little twin comanche and the whole time my instructor who was a very very experienced um airline pilot 
at the time. He was kind of filling in, um, doing some of my IFR training. And he said, okay, uh, your job is to watch the air temperature gauge because if it drops a few more degrees, it's going to be all icing conditions and we have to turn around. <laughs> and I remember the whole entire flight was kind of based around that, which nowadays I don't think you'd, you know, there'd be more precautions around that. But yeah. that was some good experience and that uh, that kind of introed me into okay well what's you know what's it like flying in the icing conditions um because that's a part of regular everyday flying for me um mm -hmm. in the rocky mountains with you know the this type of airplane um yep. but uh uh so it's a but you know being with an experienced instructor really helps hone that sort of you they can pass that sort of knowledge on to you mm -hmm. um uh that is very valuable because then for me, um, flying into the, the kind of weather that I do now, which is, which is actually quite normal. Um, you already have like the tools and the knowledge of how to handle that. And the worst thing you can do is, is get, is lose all your confidence in, um, in handling a situation. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, like flying into icing conditions is, um, it's not a panic situation, but it's something you have to deal with, right? Yep. But I mean, especially, I mean, the last thing you ever want to do is panic, no matter what. Um, yeah. So that's uh, that's just something that comes from having a good instructor that has experience, and I think that's that's one of the things that every student should do before they start their training is make sure they have someone that that can pass on that knowledge to them, uh, or if they work in the real world, that they get linked up with that sort of uh, training. Yeah, definitely, I agree with you there. All right. And then, um, so if you were to go back and redo your whole journey again to where you are now, what are some things that you do differently and some things you do the same? Uh, I would, uh, well, actually, um, things I would do differently would be, I would have, uh, being up here in Canada, I maybe would have looked at the military route. Okay. Um, but it's not for everybody, but that part kind of fascinated me. Uh, another thing I would do different is I would have, probably done a little bit more networking at the at my like flight school mm -hmm. and you know made a made 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 more friends at that part of the journey sure. um i kind of did everything kind of by myself uh, i didn't really talk to students i didn't know any of the other students or anything like that um because i was pretty young so i was pretty shy but then uh i think i did it pretty uh, you know one of the best things i did was I practiced because I had a, an interest in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Uh, every, you can't underestimate the power of that. It is literally, yeah. it is, it, I mean, it was better and more effective. I practiced approaches on my at home flight simulator. Yeah. Like relentlessly. And I got so good at flying approaches um, that when I went to flight safety for the first time ever, uh, the, uh, I was so prepared to fly in, uh, you know, like a, like a, like in a simulator environment, um, reading approaches was easy. It just, uh, er everything about flying in a simulator became so much easier because I practiced at home, even though that flight safety, it's a full motion simulator and it's, you know, you're in the actual cockpit of the airplane, mm -hmm. um, whereas at home and you're just looking at a computer screen, but but the method, you know, your method of like reading approaches and understanding your situational awareness was all I owe, a, you know, huge gratitude to Flight Simulator for helping me do that and yep. just practicing on there. Um, that's one thing I think that that uh, that can help everybody with their IFR training. And when I went to Flight Safety. Everybody kind of looked at me like, well, this guy's very inexperienced. Yeah, I would, you know, they kind of were very skeptical. And when I did my, my check ride on the, on the 425, uh, my instructor, I, just by luck, I had the worst or like the most, he was one of the best instructors, actually, but he was one of the most harsh and he did things that weren't even fair. And I remember when I first showed up, one of the uh, students there who was there for recurrent training, um, he was this older fella. And he actually told me, he said, you should change your instructors. This guy will destroy you in the sim. It's yeah. not going to be fun. And uh, it was very hard, but I had practiced so much in my flight team that I could load approaches real easily. I knew, mm -hmm. I, I understood where I was, so I could just focus on flying the airplane yeah. and uh, dealing with the emergencies and stuff. 
And by the end of the, my, my initial ride, um, this guy who was just a hard ass, he was this, he was this, he was, he was this really experienced short guy, not, no comedy at all, just straight to business. He'd do things in the simulator that weren't even fair. And they warned <laughs> me about that. But by the time I finished it, I never crashed the plane, which was good. <laughs> and um, after the week of training, uh, he said, wow, Evan, he's like, you know what? I'm very impressed. You, you know, your skills are probably some, you know, they're, they're probably some of the best I've seen for a while. And he says, and I appreciate you sticking it out <laughs> with me. And he said, everybody thinks I'm a hard ass around here, but, um, uh, and that meant a, a lot to me. So that kind of, you know, that changed my whole perspective on, on having, you know, strict instruction and taking criticism the right way, rather than thinking that someone's just being mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. But, uh, but flight simulator was a huge part of that. Yep. And, uh, and so if you can get interested in, in practicing on there, it's such a great tool. And it's more accurate than even a lot of these uh, flight school motion simulators that they have. Um, so, yeah, I found that I could go home. And, yeah, and I found I could go home, practice on my flight sim at home, uh, and do more realistic approaches than I would at the flying school I was at. So, <laughs> yeah, so, I agree yeah. with you, man. Definitely. Like, during my instrument, I don't know if you can see, I have my computer back here there's a yoke attached to the desk there but oh, there <laughs> yeah so uh, awesome. it helped me a lot man i remember just when holds didn't make sense to me when approaches didn't make sense to me I, i'd come here sit down my fourth flight open and just actually do the yeah. approach like i was in the airplane and that definitely yeah. rocketed my uh ifr experiences i mean i could fly in actual clouds you know even though i wasn't yeah, totally. in an airplane yeah and the, cool, and the cool thing is about flight simulator and i don't know people some some might give me some criticism on this but like you can practice approaches in any airplane you want oh yeah <laughs> like i remember download i remember i was kind of a flight sim geek and i would download the 737 and i could go through the checklist and start it up and do all that kind of stuff yeah but then i started flying approaches and um uh learning how to kind of use the flight simulator uh fms in the in the 737 and it got to a point where like, i could fly approaches at the speeds and at the pace of an airplane like that. So then all of a sudden when I got into the Cessna Conquest, which is, you know, quite a bit slower, it only does about 270 knots. All of a sudden that was just like, it was like, it felt like a snail's pace. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. It slows uh, everything down, yeah. So great way to to <clears throat> to level up your skills in, uh, uh, you know, at home. Because if you want, you can, I mean, you can fly approaches in the Concorde if you want. So you can, yeah, you can yeah. kind of throw in some experience there and be like, well, you know, I mean, it wasn't an actual Concorde, but hey, you know what? <laughs> I flew the approach at, yeah. you know, Mach 5 or, well, Mach 2. <laughs> you know, <laughs> do whatever you want. You can, you can experiment in all sorts of ways. And I think mm -hmm. it still adds significant value to your mm -hmm. training. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you there. All right. And then I saw, if, have you had any failures throughout your, training or um anything and has they affected you in any way um yeah like uh if i recall my uh my ifr written test i think i failed that the first time okay um my multi-engine ride i forgot to turn on some fuel pumps before landing so i had to come back and do part of the it was a partial pass on that so mm -hmm. little things like that but okay. Um, if you have good and experienced instructors, they'll understand that because they'll have seen all sorts and types. And if you're the kind type of person that knows how to kind of, you know, take criticism the right way and and not be affected too much by a, by not a, by not accomplishing something on schedule, then um, if you tackle it the right way, you can get back into you know just going through the books and reading what you may be messed up on or putting in some extra practice time, um, then I don't think there's anything to really fear about failing something when yep. you're flying. The worst thing you can do is just be totally scared from, from, uh, from, from ever getting, you know, from ever doing something again because you didn't, it didn't work out the first time. Yep. Um, like I've made, I've made some really crappy landings, uh, but granted like the, the Cessna conquest I've let, you know, that's the plane I'm primarily flying. Mm -hmm. And 
um, I can say, you know, with my experience in it, I can, I can, I, I'm very good at landing those airplanes. Silky yep. smooth. Um, but every once in a while, there'll be like a week straight where I just, <laughs> my landings aren't that pretty. Yeah, it happens, <laughs> and, man. <laughs> and yeah. You do that. And you say, well, that's just, like, you know, I don't know. Maybe it was, maybe, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's cause I, you know, maybe it's cause I woke up on the wrong side of the bed or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have left shoe on first. Or right. Whatever. But you sneezed before you landed. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It, but it's, it's just one, one of those things that it's a very, Flying is, is still a, a, an art form. And it's funny because uh, there's a, a very experienced pilot that I know. Um, he, does, he does some flying with, with me. Um, and uh, actually, I feel comfortable saying his name. His name's Dean, but he's, a, he's, he's flown 747s, 777s. He's flown literally everything in the book. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's every airliner you imagine he's flown it. And um, a very experienced pilot. I think he's got 20... 25,000 hours um, in the air. So very experienced pilot. Mm -hmm. And I've asked him, I ask him all sorts of fun questions. Like, you know, have you ever, you know, like what, like, what's it like flying like the triple seven with, you know, with students. And he's like, well, it's just like every other airplane. It's like sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you bounce the thing down the <laughs> runway. And, uh, and in talking to someone like that, uh, you realize that, uh, that flying no matter what you're flying there's a, an element of kind of artful skill in being able to land an airplane and and it's not going to be perfect every single time uh no matter what your experience is and i uh, you know i ask them all sorts of questions like well what you know have you ever have you ever uh, have you ever landed like a 200 million dollar you know airliner <laughs> yeah. realize oh I didn't do so well there. And he's like, oh, yeah. I'm like, well, what's the result of that? He's like, well, I just don't go on to greet the passengers. <laughs> so they leave. Kind of just hide in the cockpit. And, yeah. You know, it's, yeah, it's okay to not be perfect every time, but um, you, you can always you can always learn from those mistakes. But sometimes you just got to know that there's nothing you can really learn from something mm -hmm. because uh, it's just a matter of reflexes. And sometimes it just doesn't pan out perfect every time. Yeah. And you can't too hard on yourself right so yeah i think every experienced pilot will say the same thing yeah definitely i agree with you i mean even with flight training you know um there's a lot of days where you have slumps where you're not doing right you feel like you're not getting anything and it's just too much for you um just taking a step back you know looking at the situations and then going back to it will definitely help you too definitely yeah, yeah I, I completely agree so yeah all right and then so let's talk about your end goal with flying so right now you're flying to these great places you know having fun going fishing and all that so yeah. where do you see yourself later on with flying uh you know what i i don't really know i didn't really have a plan to actually become like a commercial pilot to begin with i just <laughs> I, you know i always want to fly mm -hmm. um but uh i i think uh I, I like i really enjoy the flying i'm doing right now but i think there's i think there's some bigger plans for for me as far as uh, I'd like to, I'd like to fly some other airplanes at some point and, um, and get some experience in some different sort of operations. Uh, but the, the YouTube thing has been a, a cool endeavor for me because all of a sudden now I feel like I can sort of uh, live a, you know, many different um, aviation lifestyles vicariously through other people now if i you know if i the more i'm kind of involved in that community mm -hmm. um you know it, it uh, there's i have this plan that i've been putting together here for the last little while where it's going to be sort of like a like an interview series with some people that uh, are you know that ha that have a lot to contribute to the aviation community but but don't really have the platform to do it mm -hmm. um and that's going to be a big part of kind of where i go forward from here and if it works it works out great. If yeah. it doesn't, then you know it'll be at least well. At least I tried that, and uh, I think that's going to be, you know, um, a uh, uh, that's one of the perks of doing the stuff, doing some stuff online, mm -hmm. is that you get access to lots of different people. I mean, I was talking to um, some some other people I never thought I'd ever get to to be associated with or have conversations with. Yeah, um, have come about that way. Whereas if you didn't. If I wasn't doing that, or like what you're doing here, right? Um, I would never get to meet the high caliber pilots that I, you know, that 
that uh, you know I would dream of getting to getting to know. So, so yeah, I I think for me the future is uh, is I'd like to still keep making videos and kind of amp that up to a level where I you know where I can do it more consistently and maybe get into um, some different facets of aviation and stuff because as as a pilot you can't do it all right like. No. I'd love to do- <laughs> I'd love to do more float plane flying. I'd love to, uh, um, I'd love to go fly up north more in the bush. I'd like to go fly in the jungle at some point. Maybe I'd yeah. like to fly for an airline, right? But you just can't do all of those things. Yeah. So uh, to be able to uh, talk to people that do, uh, I think there's or doing like what you're doing there's, is a great opportunity actually to sort of be involved in that mm-hmm. because now you can help. Uh, uh, talk to those people that can share their stories, right? So yeah, definitely. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and like so, like that YouTube thing. How did that get started? Um, what was your idea behind that, and how did you kind of go by that? Um, oh, the the YouTube was just kind of by accident. I just sort of well, I shouldn't say by accident, but I, I posted a couple of videos, and and then I, I I watched a few other YouTubers like in the aviation kind of department, and then I just. I just thought, hey, you know, I'm going to kind of do my own style, which was sort of like the first person view sort of thing mm-hmm. or the, the sorry, the, the like the POV sort of style. And I've noticed a couple other YouTubers doing it now, um, but I feel like I was kind of the first to do that. Okay. Um, I look like a complete idiot walking around the airport that <laughs> way, but it's kind of the sacrifice you have to make. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it just kind of just started and... Um, uh, I, I've always said to every, to anybody that wants to start a YouTube channel that there is definitely, <clears throat> there's no better way to do it than to just slug it out and do it the authentic way, make your own content, make sure that there's, you know, don't take any shortcuts to try to do it because at the end of the day, uh, you need, re- you know, you need real people on your channel. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so this, this YouTube channel has been a completely organic thing for me. Um, and it really started getting more, uh, you know, getting more uh, views and subscribers uh, when I started posting a lot more educational stuff. Um, so things that might be sort of mundane, mm-hmm. um, a lot of people have been kind of fascinated with that. So, I've, you know, I've had a lot of uh, videos do quite well just based off of that premise that you, if you can teach someone, teach people something. Yep. <clears throat> even though you know a lot of pilots would probably i mean I've, it doesn't come without its criticism from people being like well this is silly like obviously everybody knows that but yeah <clears throat> not true like there's so many people that don't and it's mm-hmm. still fascinating to a lot um of you know people looking to get into aviation that maybe don't know that stuff yet mm-hmm. um, but the youtube thing was just kind of by fluke and uh it's led to lots of cool opportunities so far it's still in my eyes still a small channel um um, it'd be nice to get to a hundred thousand subscribers in the next month or so, but, uh, you know, it, it, building it organically does mean you have to be producing content and you have to be thinking about what you're going to put out there. Definitely. Yeah. And, and for me, I really want to make sure that it's valuable stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, like I said, there's no real shortcut to doing it. I mean, there's ways you can be smart about it, like think about what you're going to make, mm-hmm. um, and try to plan around that. But no, I think, uh, I think being in the airplane all the time always offers like some sort of opportunity that you can, you can always share something or teach something. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, I've been trying to focus on that and, uh, and, and as it grows, I I have no idea where, you know, where it goes from there, but I think there's, you know, there's, I mean, there's obviously sponsorship opportunities, which have kind of all just kind of showed up once you start posting more, Mm -hmm. um, once you start, getting some videos really noticed um all the sponsorship stuff uh sort of just seems to find you at that point and yep. and if it's something that you really use all the time <clears throat> um garmin's a big uh, uh, one that i was really really happy to do some work with and uh um obviously i'm wearing the garmin watch right now <laughs> freaking awesome yeah um and all of our avionics are Garmin. so yeah uh, doing some work for them it was just you know, I was promoting their stuff regardless, right? So yeah. even if I wasn't a, uh, uh, you know, if there was no sponsor relationship or ambassador relationship with them, I was still promoting their stuff. Obviously, I do more more of it now mm-hmm. um, because uh, because of the relationship. But um, 
but uh, that's one of the benefits of of sharing, you know, trying of sharing valuable content is that mm-hmm. is that then there's opportunity for actual brands who sell things to pilots and that have an impact in the aviation world mm-hmm. to work with you, right? Yep. Um, so uh, if you can kind of stick to that, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> don't get in a rush necessarily to get to, to to grow your channel. Just do it authentically, and it will if it's if it's if it's valuable if there's anything that someone can learn from it it will grow on its own yeah <laughs> that's, that's, that's the way it goes yeah and as long as you're offering uh as long as you're offering people information and things that they need definitely it's gonna help you out to grow and move on yeah and like yeah. I, you know i i sell um you know i <clears throat> i have a I do some affiliate work on there too with with like uh, like flying eye sunglasses, they're mm-hmm. amazing. But the only reason I I choose to do you know to choose to kind of work well to work with them and promote their glasses is because I actually think they're they are awesome. Yeah. Like so, um, <clears throat> so there's been some some opportunities that just I'm just I'm just like I, would I promote this if they weren't paying me? No, and then I just won't work with with those brands, right? So mm-hmm. uh, there has to be you know I I can't. Uh, it, 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 working on YouTube offers lots of opportunities, but you still have to filter those out in order to make sure that that it's going to align with what you really like creating, right? So yep. for me, creating stuff for Garmin, I just love doing that because yeah. it's part of just me making awesome, you know, make, me me making stuff that I think is cool aviation content, and uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, so I'm happy to do that every time I make a video. Right. So. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. All right. And then also, last question. So, if there's that one tip that you have for someone who's getting into aviation right now, or someone who's pursuing their dreams already, what's that one tip? Uh, the one tip would be to get to know as many people as you can, especially old people, <laughs> like old people at airports. They're eventually they're all gonna disappear. They're not going to live forever, and uh, they know every. Actually, I did make a reel about that, and I'm going to post it soon. But it's it's so good. I was just like, I just, I keep holding on to it. I'm like, I'll post it on the specific. Day. Yeah, <laughs> and it's all about um, <clears throat> meeting old people at airports and network with old people. Um, I mean, you know, you can make friends with whoever you want, but um, always get to know the old people that run the airports mm-hmm. and. Um, uh, they have all the connections. They're the ones that dictate what goes on because they've seen it all. They know everything that there is to know about aviation. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, there's some that maybe are you know a little bullheaded, but you, they're probably the best resources you can find. Yeah. Um, anytime you're at an airport, <clears throat> I always like to do some sort of you know talking with people that that you meet and. Um, uh, if they're even if they're just flying, it's amazing. You'll fly, you'll see someone with a small airplane flying, and there'll be you know some you know some older individual, um, and they'll it's amazing like the connections they'll mm-hmm. have. Um, <clears throat> so I, I always recommend that, and I put it in one of my videos. I was like, "What's the number one rule for getting first job?" And I actually thought when I posted this video, I thought, "Well, oh, I'm going to say this, and there's going to be all this kind of kickback." Like, yeah, that's kind of a you know, a cheap way to, uh, to, or, you know, like that's, no, it all comes down to like your experience Mm -hmm. and stuff. And the amount of pilots that got on there and said, wow, this is, you know, this is exactly how I got my first job, um, was just through networking or through an old friend that I met at the airport or, you know, la 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 was significant. That was like probably the most common ground. I, you know, I listed off, I was like, Hey, what's one, What's the one thing you need to get a good job? Well, you need good experience. And then I was like, and then you also need good flying hours. And you also need to have, you know, a whole bunch of other skills aside from being a pilot that will help you get a good job. Yeah. And the last one's like, and just network with all the old people at airports. Yeah. And the most common one that everybody related to was like, oh, yeah, like I got my first job, not because of the first three, but because I networked at the airport. <laughs> you know, so number one rule i think yeah definitely networking is a big thing when it comes to aviation knowing someone or someone who knows someone definitely can take you a long ways yeah i know a guy that uh he was i think he had 300 and maybe 350 hours mm-hmm. and uh he knew the right people to get him in the right airplane at the right time and uh, he'd be able to correct me on 
how this happened, but uh, he was flying a Gulfstream 150, like literally all over. Like wow. he checkmarked the whole. <laughs> like after two years of flying, he was kind of like, "Yeah, okay, I think I've checkmarked the whole aviation." Thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, and it, yeah, and uh, so there's definitely ways to, you know, don't sell yourself short, but just get out there and meet people. Yep, I agree with you. All right, and then we're going to end this with a would you rather game. So I'll give you a couple options and you pick one from oh, that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So okay. first one is would you rather fly general aviation or commercial? General aviation, for sure. <laughs> All right. And uh, so would you rather fly over beaches or mountains? Mountains. Perfect. Yeah. And then would you rather fly high wing or low wing? Oh, I don't know. Um, you know what? High, uh, <laughs> I'd rather fly a high wing. Okay. Did you train wing. in the highway? <laughs> highway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to see what you're flying over. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. And then, so, would you rather fly Airbus or Boeing? Uh, you know what? Boeing. Because I've been to the factory. and uh, yeah, I, got, I got this shirt. Yeah, no, I, I got this shirt right here. <laughs> so, I, I, would, I would say a Boeing. <laughs> but you know what? I'm not prejudiced to Airbus or Boeing. I just... Yeah. I just... It's a healthy debate. But I think... <laughs> I don't know. Maybe someday they'll like actually make a competition, but it would be like mm -hmm. you know, it'll be two runways, and they'll have they'll just be like drag races, <laughs> Boeing or something. Yeah, just to cut the break yeah, and yeah, say like exactly. this one is the yeah. the <laughs> better one. Which one can do all right? And then, barrel roll. I mean, actually, Boeing they did do barrel rolls during their flight testing and demonstrations back in the day. So I'm gonna go with Boeing. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that last one, would you rather fly IFR or VFR? Uh, I love flying IFR. I feel very comfortable flying IFR. I love flying right. weather. I like the uh, uh, I like flying into just from my experience, I love flying in conditions where there's some a little bit of icing and the clouds are bumpy and you, fl you know that happens a lot on the coast and lower visibility. I love that kind of flying. Uh, but VFR is still the best. <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely nothing nothing beats vfr but also like ifr when you like shoot an approach maybe and then you just the clouds just clear out and the runway is right there that that's the that's best the most satisfying thing <laughs> oh ever. yeah yeah and i love doing that i would much rather fly the plane i'm flying right now on a mediocre crappy day than a blue skies sunny day for yeah. sure i like that i like it a lot more definitely well, all right, man. Well, it's yeah, been great. Sure. Almost an hour here. But it's been such a great conversation, man. <laughs> yeah, man. This is exciting. I'm excited to see how this turns out. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, man. I really appreciate you being here, man. It's uh, such an amazing having Dude, you on. Thank you, man. This is awesome. I'm looking forward to all the other ones that you do here. So uh, always great to, to meet people like yourself that are helping um, – spread the word about aviation and stuff like that so <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely all right man it's good to see you that's it for this episode thank you so much for taking the time i really hope you enjoyed it and found it beneficial don't forget to check out evan loves youtube channel you'll definitely love the great content that he puts out and don't forget to leave a review and follow the podcast on any of the platforms you're listening to this on until next time keep the blue side up we'll see you